In this video lecture, we're going to look at immunity, which is basically means that you've got the built-in defenses so that you can avoid getting an infection. And then we'll also look at immune disorders. And of course, this is when your immune system isn't working properly. So to do that, we'll look first at primary versus secondary immune response, and then look at the different types of immunity, such as active and passive. And then we'll look at immune disorders like autoimmune diseases and AIDS. Now our immunity is due to those memory cells that we've accumulated when we were first exposed to an antigen. And those memory cells can proliferate very quickly when exposed to that antigen again, and then therefore prevent us from getting the disease. So the primary exposure occurs, let's say you're exposed to some a cold virus, and so here on day one, and that primary exposure it has a delay of about three to six days in order for the B cells to proliferate and make enough antibodies to fight that virus. Um, now the, the amount of viruses you make and the delay isn't great, so you end up having the cold and the symptoms and you feel like crud. But eventually you recover and the number of antibodies are declining because you don't need them anymore. You're not, B cells aren't making them anymore. But you've got memory cells now. So let's say you pass that cold on to your roommate. You've recovered from the cold. Your roommate has the cold, but she decides to sneeze on you and try to give you the cold back. Well, now you're going to make a huge increase in number of antibodies because those memory cells proliferate much faster and quicker. And therefore, since you make these antibodies so quickly, your body in that secondary exposure are going to get rid of the um, cold virus before you even develop any symptoms. Now, the problem with colds, though, of course, is that colds mutate very quickly. So as we pass that cold from person to person, three months later, that same virus, so to speak, comes back to you. It's really not the same virus. It's mutated to the point that it's now a whole new set of antigens, and so now you get a cold again. There's another way to look at this. Here we've got uh, B cells make, being proliferating and then forming into plasma smells and making antibodies. So this takes a little bit longer, not a huge amount of antibodies. But we've also got memory cells here. So here we have the cold, we're sick. So, but we have the memory cells. So when we're exposed again, those memory cells quickly differentiate into plasma cells, lots and lots of them, lots and lots of antibodies. And so we can fight the disease or the pathogen before you get sick. The memory cells are also there uh, going to be produced because we might be exposed to that pathogen again down the road. So we want to make sure these memory cells are in place to give us our immunity. Now there are different types of immunity. Um, they all are acquired. We acquired immunity, that is we built the immunity for them. In active immunity, you, div you yourself are actively involved in, in making the antibodies, the memory cells, against that pathogen. So this so active immunity develops after exposure to that antigen. So we have two types. They can be either naturally acquired or induced active immunity. Now naturally acquired active immunity is that you went through the disease, just like I talked about the cold virus. You went through the cold, you developed the memory cells, but you had to suffer through the disease. The childhood um, diseases like chicken pox and mumps from my generation in particular are examples of this. I had chicken pox. I went through the disease. I had little bumps all over me and neck um, from the mumps. So I went through those diseases, but now I'm immune to them because I have the memory cells for them. Induced or artificially acquired immunity is provided through vaccines. Here you get deliberate exposure to the antigen. These now, obviously, this is going to be, you know, in controlled conditions, we want to make sure the vaccines are good. So the vaccines are going to be either dead uh, pathogens or, or attenuated, which means they are living, but they're extremely weakened, so they aren't strong enough to cause any disease. Or there are components of the pathogen, something, any, any way, some part of that pathogen that's going to end up triggering immune response. So now you get the immune response, but you don't get the disease. And so it's, like I said, a vaccine. But now since you have the primary immune response to the vaccine, 
you now have the memory cells so when you are exposed to that pathogen you aren't going to get the disease because again you have this those memory cells in place now passive immunity is when you don't make the antibodies yourself they're provided to you so the antibodies come from another source examples of where we may see this include say a person who has is B cell immunodeficient they're not they don't make B cells so they can't make the memory cells and so they would never make the antibodies um, or a person with high susceptibility to a disease without adequate time to develop Im, um, immunity to it. Think, uh, uh, for example, I went to Nicaragua. Um, before I went, I should have gotten a Hep A vaccine. And I procrastinated and didn't get one. Now, Hep A is more commonly found in less developed countries where sanitation isn't great. Um, people, so you have a higher incidence of Hep A there. Um, and it's passed by basically it's the one why you wash your hands before, um, after going to the bathroom particularly for those working in food industry like in a restaurant so it's recommended that people that go to less developed countries should get a hep a vaccine i didn't i forgot and so my doctor instead gave me a shot of antibodies against hep a so that way I was protected the two weeks I was in Nicaragua, but they, you know, don't last forever. Um, and so it's not, I'm not immune to Hep A, it just kind of is a temporary protection against um, getting Hep A while I was in Nicaragua. Another one is you can inject a person with antibodies to alleviate or suppress a toxin. Um, the good examples of this is tetanus or rabies. So the rabies shots are actually antibodies to fight the rabies. Um, and help prevent the person from getting sick. Now we can classify passive immunity as either naturally acquired or artificially acquired or induced passive immunity. Now naturally acquired passive immunity is going to be from mother to baby, either through the placenta or the breast milk. So the baby is providing, getting the antibodies naturally, but they are not producing them, or yeah, they're not producing themselves, so that's why it's passive. Induced or artificially acquired passive immunity would be all these examples that I showed up here, um, where you're giving a person shots of antibodies to help them fight against infection. Um, a good another example of this one um, would be tetanus. Shots are artificially acquired passive. You're just getting shots of antibodies to protect you against tetanus or that Rogam that was given to um, women when they're exposed to Rh positive antigens and so that preventing them from developing Rh antibodies. Again, these are typically short-lived. They don't give you lifelong immunity, but at least they give you immunity in the short term. As far as immune disorders go, we can look at a couple of those. There's autoimmune disorders. This is basically when the immune system attacks itself. Um, examples that we see with this include rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, Graves disease we've already looked at. We've also looked at type 1 diabetes. Uh, and here's a list of a lot of other ones as well. Notice they are more prevalent in women than in men for some reason, not quite exactly known why. Uh, treatment usually is going to be to suppress the immune system by using corticosteroids um, and therefore if you have, a, you have less likelihood of, of these immune cells attacking your cells if they're suppressed. Or we can use antibodies against cell adhesion molecules so that um, white blood cells don't know where to exit the blood and therefore we can reduce um, inflammation. Why we develop immune disorders or autoimmune disorders is not clearly understood. They know that the, the development of um, immune disorders has three contributing factors to it. One is genetics, that is some people are genetically predisposed to um, or likelihood of getting an autoimmune disease. They know that it has to do with immunoregulation, that something's off. They are our T uh, regulatory cells aren't functioning properly or to keep the um, immune system at bay. So basically the idea is that the immune system is now a little hyperactive because we don't have the suppressing nature of those regulation 
regulatory cells. It also has probably something to do a component of the environment uh, with the pathogen itself. Um, and so the combination of these three factors, genetics, immunoregulation, and environment, the combination of those often can lead then to an autoimmune disease of some kind. Now, the, how much they contribute to development of an autoimmune disease is going to be dependent uh, more on the individual and the disease. So it's not a clear-cut kind of thing going on. So things that we may include as possibilities that cause autoimmune disease is that the foreign antigens are just too similar to our own. So our immune system mounts an immune response to some foreign pathogen or antigen. That antigen seems to be very similar to our own antigens. And so our immune system mistakes our own antigens as a foreign one and starts attacking it, attacking our um, cells. That can is the idea they think behind rheumatoid arthritis. There's not enough immunosuppression as I mentioned before simply our immune system is hyperactive and so it starts attacking our own body cells. Also there may be new self antigens that appear that is remember our, our T cells have been educated in the thymus for our to recognize our own antigens well now if we create new self antigens those T cells haven't been educated on them and that could cause a problem. So things like gene mutations that could result in new self antigens or changes in the structure of self antigens by haptins or infectious damage or even release of new novel self antigens because of some trauma. And so now we have these new self antigens that our body was never really exposed to and so we mount an immune response. And that's of course not what we want. Other immune disorders are immunodeficiency diseases. This is when our immune system simply fails to develop or is blocked from, fail, uh, from developing. So think of SCID as one of these severe combined immunodeficiency disease. This is the boy in the bubble disease where simply the uh, immune system never developed. And so exposure to any kind of pathogen, um, this boy doesn't have um, the immune system fight it off and can die from the simplest of infections. Now bone marrow transplants and gene splicing techniques have been used then to treat SCID pretty successfully. AIDS is another one. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome caused by an HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. This virus is a retrovirus meaning it has RNA instead of DNA in it. A virus needs to find a way to enter a cell. So in AIDS, the HIV virus has to bind to CD4 cells, and therefore if that uses that CD4, or binds to the CD4 glycoprotein on CD4 cells, and that's the way it finds its way into the cell, so where it could replicate. And of course, remember our CD4 cells are helper T cells. And since our CD4 cells are helper T cells, and helper T cells are the generals that run the whole show, that's basically why um, we have this impaired immune response. Um, you're, without the T helper cells, you're much more susceptible to pathogens, so you get opportunistic infections, higher risk of cancer, because we don't have the immunological surveillance that's provided by cytotoxic T cells. Remember, cytotoxic T cells have to be excited by or, or activated by helper T cells. But now we have no helper T cells to activate them. The infections are most likely through contact of blood, semen, or vaginal secretions. And so because of that, the most at-risk populations are people who participate in unsafe sex with multiple partners or intravenous drug users that share needles. Now the HIV virus has a particular life cycle to it. How it works is this the virus injects its RNA into the host cell, the CD4 cell. That, vi that RNA um, has to be converted into DNA and there's an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that does that. Once the RNA has been converted to DNA, we call it a provirus. The provirus then gets incorporated into the host DNA uh, and then the host starts making viral parts and those viral parts will assemble 
and out pops a new virus. So the idea of treating people that are HIV positive or even with AIDS um, is that they we need to block this life cycle and we have a number of ways of doing that and this slide here shows all the different drugs or or places where drugs actually will block some aspect of the HIV virus's life cycle. Now a few of the drugs that may be more familiar, there's fusion inhibitors. These uh, block viral entry into the cell. There's a different couple of different types of what are called uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors and the idea here is to stop the conversion of the RNA to DNA and therefore it can't get incorporated into our own DNA. Um, AZT is one of those that was one of the first drugs ever produced to fight AIDS. Um, then there's also protease inhibitors which is another one you may have heard of before. This basically inhibits protease which is used to help assemble the vir virus Usually a combination of drugs is used to treat people who are HIV positive because if you use only one drug, the HIV virus mutates quite re regularly and therefore is likely to develop resistance against one drug. But if you give multiple drugs, the HIV virus is unlikely to mutate from multiple drugs and become resistance to all of them at once. So again, use multiple drugs in various combinations, which requires you know a very regimented time to take the drugs and requires um, quite a bit of expense. Um, protease inhibitors on their own cost about six thousand, eight thousand dollars per year. So this is expensive um, to deal with. But we've had a great amount of success here in the United States in treating them, um, in treating people that are HIV positive. Um, things have improved. Unfortunately, in less developed countries like those countries in Africa, HIV is still an epidemic because those countries simply can't afford the drugs nor be able to get the drugs to people in those remote areas. So that ends our lectures on the immune system.